Let's take our Bibles tonight, Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians, uh, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. We're going to begin a series tonight, uh, Developing Christ Honoring Character. And as believers, each and every one of us should have character that honors Christ. Now, some people will say that we are characters, and uh, I guess it's okay to be a character as long as you have character. And we're going to look tonight, we're going to begin by reading Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But then we're going to look at the broader context of the passage of Scripture. And tonight's just going to be an introduction, if you will, to the series. And next week we'll begin looking at character trait by character trait that is honoring to Christ. So let's begin in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the day that you've given us today. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have tonight to gather together. And for those unable to be here tonight, to be able to tune in on the live stream. And Lord, we're grateful for each and every one of those as well. But Lord, I pray tonight, as we open up your word and as we uh, teach your word, I pray to the Lord that we'll be receptive to it, we'll be sensitive to the Spirit, and Lord, that we may grow thereby. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we mentioned a moment ago, we're beginning this series on developing Christ-honoring character. And in doing so, we find in this passage of Scripture the fruit of of the Spirit, and just as a, as a spoiler, I guess, the only way we can have Christ-honoring character is by, by exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Now, there's a lot of talk about some of these fruits of the Spirit. Sometimes it's in the positive, and sometimes it's in the negative. I think, for instance, the first one that's mentioned is love. And there's a lot today about love that's mentioned. In fact, in a lot of churches, the only thing you hear preached and sometimes, it seems, is love. The danger, though, in this is because love is such a well-known topic, if we're not careful, when the topic of love is mentioned, we will almost tune out. And I mentioned this a little bit on Sunday about getting the most out of church is realizing that when we gather together and open up the Word, though it is for those who may be down the pew or those who may be at home watching, or maybe for your thinking in your mind for those who aren't tuned in and those who aren't here, we need to understand that when the Word of God is opened, it is for me. You know, it like, reminds me of the song, It's Not My Brother Nor My Sister, uh, But It's Me, O Lord, Standing in the Need of Prayer. And the reality is when we open the Bible, our heart should be, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but me, O Lord, that is in need of your word and of its teachings. But if we're not careful, when we hear a familiar topic, I did not say a topic that we're good at, but rather even just familiar, sometimes we'll tune that out. And love is a common theme. The problem is this, even though it's a common theme, it's not easy to describe and it's not easy to to define. One of the questions I often ask in premarital counseling is this, why are you getting married? Now you say, well, because they want to. Well, of course they want to, and there's no specific answer I'm looking for. I'm just hoping that it's not a shotgun wedding or anything like that. And uh, one of the most common is because I love them. Well, what does that mean? And boy, that's actually a tough question because love is hard to describe. Sometimes though, children have great perspectives. In fact, if we're honest, sometimes out of, the, out of the mouth of babes comes some very good wisdom, and sometimes maybe not so much. There was a group of children that were asked the question, what is love? Greg, who was eight years old, said this, love is the most important thing in the world. But baseball's pretty good, too. <laughs> May, age nine, remarked, no one is sure why love happens, but I've heard that it has something to do with how you smell. And that's why perfume and deodorant is so popular. And uh, <laughs> nine-year-old Roger said this, it's like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. And so I'm not sure what example he had in mind. Leo, age seven, said this. He said, if falling in love is anything like learning how to spell, I don't want to do it because it takes too long. <laughs> This one I thought was pretty good, though. Bobby, who was eight, 
He recognized the power of love. He says, love will find you even if you're trying to hide from it. He said, I've been trying to hide from it since I was five, but girls just keep finding me. Brother Blau, that reminded me of your grandson, something he might say, but it just keeps finding me. But as we look, and I just use love as an example in introduction, as we look at these, we're going to find some of these are hard to define, but if we're honest, they're even harder to live. That's why it is the fruit of the Spirit and not the fruit of the flesh. But before we look at these fruits or these character traits that come from living and walking according to the Spirit, I think there are some preliminary things that would help us as we go into this study. So in order to do this, this is where context is important, we're going to go back a few verses and look at the verses leading up to this, beginning in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then it goes on to say in verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. Now this is very important for us to understand. The flesh and the Spirit are not working in harmony, but in fact are working at odds. The first thing we need to understand with this in mind is the fact that we cannot create fruit on our own. Having this Christ-honoring character does not come by just deciding we're going to do it. Now, sometimes this is the mentality we'll take toward the commands of Scripture. We get the idea almost like we go to the library, we read a self-help book, and we decide I'm going to put that into action. But what happens so many times after we do that? We fail. New Year's resolutions. January of this year, people made resolutions that they were going to have the best year of their life. And oh, did they not see 2020 coming? (laughs) I saw the other day where somebody put all... Many of these churches having 2020 vision, our best year yet, did not see 2020 coming. And there's so much truth in that. We had no clue that this year would be as disrupting as it is. One of the big things that we, you know, many times at the beginning of the year, people make a resolution, they just decide they're going to do it. Uh, A lot of times it has to do with exercise. Me, I have a chart, it's still on my wall. I still plan to do it, but I better get to it. I planned on doing 150 workouts this year. Now, it sounds good, doesn't sound that hard, 150 there's 365 days in the year till you actually have to start doing it. And I was making okay progress. I'd slacked off a little bit, and then all of a sudden all the gyms are closed. And I know you can work out at home. It's all over Facebook right now. I get that, but it normally doesn't happen at home. It happens at the gym. But so many times we have this idea, I'm going to do it, and the problem is we don't. We need to understand that developing Christ-honoring character does not come from this idea of, I'm going to do it, and we just do it. Verse 17 reminds us that we have a spiritual nature that desires something that is contrary to the Spirit. Do you realize this? The fruit of the Spirit can only come from the Spirit and from listening to the Spirit. The idea that we can do this on our own is about as foolish as going to an oak tree looking for oranges. You're not going to find oranges on an oak tree. You're going to find maybe acorns falling from them, but not oranges. And sometimes we have this idea that we can, in of our own flesh and in of our own will and in of our own power, say, I'm going to be more loving, I'm going to be more long-suffering, I'm going to have more temperance, I'm going to be meek, and yes, I am. But we need to understand this truth that the fruit of the Spirit cannot be performed on our own. In fact, the Bible tells us in the, in the text here, in verses 19 through 21, what comes naturally from the flesh. Look at these, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. That means they're shown. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, 
envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. That's what your flesh will do. That's what is natural for your flesh to do. That's why as we look across society, it is so prevalent. And I know sometimes we always have this mentality, what we enjoy now is best or worst. It's never the same. But the reality is, as you look through history, these fruits of the flesh are nothing new. In fact, Paul wrote this thousands of years ago. But this is what's natural of the flesh. And so the first thing that we need to understand is developing Christ-honoring character does not come of our own. It's not just some decision you make and then suddenly we display it. We need to realize this as well. Fruit is not something that we do. Fruit is something that we display. So love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and meekness and temperance, these are not things that we produce. These are things we display. These are who we are, and therefore it shows, and we only are this because the Spirit is working in us. You know, there's a difference between works and fruit. For instance, a machine in a factory can work and turn out a product but it can never manufacture fruit. Do you realize fruit isn't manufactured, fruit grows. And sometimes what we try to do is we try to manufacture on our own these fruits, but you just can't do it because fruit has to grow. It has to ripen. It has to mature. Realize this as well. This is all under we cannot do it on our own, is that the fruit of the Spirit is never given apart from the work of Christ. You know, sometimes I think we have this idea that that the world is supposed to be filled with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, brotherly kindness, temperance, meekness. We cannot expect people who do not have the Spirit, they are not in Christ, to exhibit the the fruit of the Spirit. Once again, that would be like going to an oak tree and expecting to get oranges. However, and we're going to get to this a little bit more later, we shouldn't be able to expect an orange tree to bear oranges. So the fruit of the Spirit comes only to those who are in Christ, meaning the Holy Spirit is dwelling within them. But we do find in this text in Galatians that if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if you and I are saved, that means we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, Therefore, we ought to be bearing fruit, but it's not something we do on our own. Secondly, as we go into this series, we need to understand this as well. The fruit of the Spirit is a package deal. Did you notice in verse 22, the Bible does not say the fruits of the Spirit are? It says instead, but the fruit of the Spirit is. Do you realize the character qualities or the divine virtues we have here is a fruit, not fruits. It's like a cluster of grapes. The grapes are a fruit. It's not fruits. It's this, this idea of the fruit of the Spirit, it's not like a pick-and-choose buffet. It's not like when you go to the buffet and you're like, you know, I'll have a little bit of this, but I don't want that. I'll have a little bit of this, but I don't want that. That's not what the fruit of the Spirit is. You see, the problem is sometimes we as believers, we almost have this idea, well, I want love, joy, I want peace, but I'll be honest with you, I don't want long-suffering. I'm tired of being patient, and I don't want to be patient, so I'm just going to be who I am. Whoa, that's not the fruit of the Spirit. We don't get to pick and choose. Either you have the fruit of the Spirit or you don't. It's not a pick and choose. We can't say, I'll take a little love, a portion of peace, I'll pass on the meekness. It's an all or nothing. Thirdly, the focus is on Christian character. Character is not something you do. Character is who you are. There's a quote, I've heard it attributed to two different people. I've heard it attributed to D.L. Moody and I've heard it attributed to Abraham Lincoln. Now sometimes it's easy to tell which one something may have come from Because one person was in the 1700s and the other one was in like the 2000s. Well, obviously the 1700s came first. But D.L. Moody and Abraham Lincoln were alive 
around the same time. So who said it first? I don't know, but it's a very good statement. It's this, character is who you are. In the dark, I've also heard it when no one's looking. Because character is not something that you do. Character is who you are. It's your integral part. It is, when everything's boiled down, it's who you are. And we need to understand this. The focus here with the fruit of the Spirit is not on your works or your performance, but rather on your core of who you are. You know what this means? It's not situational. You know, sometimes I think we almost get this performance-based. We will put into it how much we think we can get out of it based on who's looking. You know, it's, it's this idea, well, if I'm going to be singing in front of hundreds, I better make sure I do a good job. But if I'm singing to the Lord my car, then who cares? That's performance-based. And sometimes if we're not careful, our Christianity, our character becomes performance-based. It depends on who's looking. Character is who you are when no one's looking. That's a quote I give to my students many times as I walk back in the classroom when we actually met in a classroom (laughs) instead of looking at a camera. But when we had our classroom and when I would walk in my classroom and they weren't doing what they were supposed to be because or do because I wasn't in the classroom. You say, how do you know they were doing that? Well, there's a couple of reasons I know that. One, I know kids, especially junior high kids. I know how I was when I was in junior high. This will shock you, but I like to talk. I do. I even did in junior high. Now, I was less likely in junior high to talk to my classmates because it was my brother and sister, and I was about tired of talking to them. But it was one of those things that, uh, for real, I know what they are and what they do. But there's also another way, and this is the other way. When you walk in the room and as you're opening the door, You hear all these wills shuffling, and the kids at that point are perfectly almost stiff as they're working straight up and down. Why? It's that whole idea, we just got busted. And I'll often say, remember, character is who you are when no one's looking. Or I'll I'll, I'll change it to character is who you are when the teacher's not in the room. Do you realize character, this Christ-honoring character, is who you are when other people aren't looking at you? But understand this, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and the evil. You see, Christ sees you all the time. And Christ knows your character. Notice it's called developing Christ-honoring character and not developing fellow Christians' honoring character. Do you realize that this is not about bringing glory to our name? This is not about bringing glory to our denomination's name. It's not about bringing glory to our hero's names. It's about bringing glory to Christ's name. We need to understand that the focus is on Christian character. Fourthly, tonight, as we go through this series, it's important that we understand that the fruit of the Spirit is displayed individually, but as individuals come together then it's displayed corporately. Do you realize we're not given the fruit of the Spirit just so that one or two of us or three of us or four of us uh, can come to church and look better and be kinder and nicer and love better and be more patient? Do you realize we all have the Spirit within us if we're saved and that as we come together, our church's identity should be Christ-honoring because each of us are Christ-honoring and we have the fruit of the Spirit? You see, almost sometimes we get this idea that if you're in certain positions or you are on a certain platform, then you ought to have these Christ-honoring character traits that are exhibited by listening to the Spirit and by showing uh, that the Spirit or displaying that the Spirit is working in our life, and that's good for them, but the pastor needs to have that for the church, or so-and-so in the church ought to have this, but the reality is our entire church ought to have this. Our church ought to be able to be be characterized by a people who are loving. By a people who exhibit the fruit of temperance. Boy, sometimes uh, people almost use this idea of I lost my temper as a badge of honor when actually it's an admittance of defeat. It's an admittance of a weakness. It's not a strength. 
It's a weakness of giving into the flesh instead of yielding to the Spirit. Fifthly, let's say this, we need to realize that not all fruit ripens at the same time. Have you ever gotten a cluster of grapes and you eat one and it's delicious, perfectly ripe, sweet, and just delicious? Then you get another one and it's a little firm, a little sour, just not quite as ripe as the other one. Or even worse yet, you get one and it's just flat out mushy. Do you realize the fruit of the Spirit doesn't always ripen at the same time? We may not have as much temperance as we do love, or as much long-suffering as we do kindness. We need to realize that they don't all ripen at the same time. But as you go through life, as you go through life, you should notice that they grow, that the fruit is being more displayed. As you look at my life, you might see the grape of joy is, is, is um, maybe a good thing, and it's being displayed greatly, but that long-suffering. Sometimes it's difficult to have joy, but we can suffer long, but sometimes it's harder to suffer long than to exhibit joy. Our fruit ripens at the different times. Sixthly, understand this, the fruit of the Spirit is the result of a normal Christian life. One of the dangers that we have in Christianity is that what should be normal has become that which is applauded. I was talking to my students one day, and uh, this gives you an idea of students and how they think. I was talking about this truth and devotions, and I said, you know, I don't expect when I come into work for the students to be lined up in the hallway applauding. Yay, Mr. Leathers! Woo, you're a hero! Because I came to work today. That's just what I do because I'm supposed to. Now, there are principles behind it. I'm supposed to because I'm supposed to provide for my family. I'm supposed to because I've committed to work for this company. I'm sp- and I could go on and on. But the point is this. I'm at work because I'm supposed to be at work. I don't expect applause. I don't expect when I go into work for them to meet me with a trophy. That's foolish. Now, of course, I walk into my classroom after devotions and all the students, yay, and they applaud. And I'm like, y'all are a bunch of crazy people. Sit down and get to work, you know. And uh, it's one of those things because they were just throwing off of my illustration. But could you imagine if every day when somebody comes to work, Everybody applauded for them? We go, this is ridiculous. They're supposed to come to work. But I'll be honest with you, because living the fruit of the Spirit has become so rare in Christianity, when someone does it, they become a hero. Can I say this? Bearing the fruit of the Spirit should not be something that is rare, but something that is normal. When you or I exhibit love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, temperance, meekness, when we exhibit those, people shouldn't be shocked. (laughs) When you react with love, people shouldn't go, whoa, what in the world got into him? Wow. I wonder if he's okay. He must have been to the doctor and someone gave him back. You know, like all these things shouldn't run through their mind because you just did what you were supposed to do as a Christian. However, when you don't exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, people should be surprised. I remember I worked at a certain place where there was a certain employee who would be fairly calm, but every now and then would fly off the handle. And when I say fly off the handle, I'm talking about you would just stay away This person's father worked with them, and he would come and calm this person down, and you just kind of stayed away. And it got to a point where sometimes there might be a new employee, and they'd be like, whoa, what in the world happened? It's like, nah, that's just what he does. Just keep working. Just stay out of it and keep working. That's just what he does. Can I tell you this? When you or I 
don't exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, it should cause people to be surprised, not go, oh, that's just what he does. You see, too often we think people ought to be surprised or applaud us when we do what we're supposed to do, but instead they should be surprised when we don't. Lastly tonight, understand this, that bearing fruit of the Spirit is both a gift and a task. Do you realize the fruit is always a gift, but it still requires hard work? You know, I think about this, the love of Christ is poured into our hearts, but you know what 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says? Pursue after charity. So as we understand and we look at this over the next several weeks about developing Christ-honoring character from the fruit of the Spirit, We need to understand going into this that yes, this is a byproduct of having the Spirit control our lives, but that doesn't mean that it's easy. See, sometimes we get this idea that if we are the proper Christian, everything's supposed to just be easy, and that's not how it works. It's almost this health and prosperity gospel that says, if you're close enough to the Lord, you won't get sick and everything's going to be okay. I saw throughout these last several months, people say that, well, um, I've got the Spirit in me, so I can't get sick. Well, that's just not biblical. Or I've heard people say, well, now that I'm getting close to the Lord, everything's easy. Well, be careful, because everything's not necessarily going to stay easy. One of the things I understand is this. I don't think I'll ever be the Christian that Job was. Look at what he went through. But we get this idea sometimes that everything's supposed to be easy. Understand this. Even though we have the Spirit dwelling within us, that doesn't necessarily mean that exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit is easy. Let me just give you one example. The word long-suffering. You know what that means? You're going to have to suffer. It doesn't mean everything gets done faster because you love the Lord. Now, we live in a society where everything's supposed to happen just like this, just like this. You go to the drive through and you get frustrated because you sat in line for so long, and it took them six minutes to fix your meal. And you say, six minutes, that ain't long. That ain't long when you're cooking, but when you're sitting in a drive through line, it feels like an eternity. And by the way, that's not suffering. But sometimes, I'm just using this example, because sometimes we get this idea that if we love the Lord and we live the way we're supposed to, that when we drive through the drive through they're already going to have our order ready and waiting for us. That's not how life goes. Long-suffering tells us that you're going to have to do some suffering. So realize this, developing Christ-honoring character is not always easy. We've been given as believers the Spirit We should display the fruit of the Spirit, but we're reminded in Galatians 5.16 then to walk in the Spirit. It's ours, it's given to us, but we have the responsibility to show to others what God has done inside. People can't see in your heart. And can I say this? I bet you're like me. You're glad. (laughs) But they ought to see externally what God has done internally. Now, as I said tonight, this is just an introductory message to our series on developing Christ's honor or in character. Next week, we're going to talk about love and what that means and how it's displayed. But can I say this? It's important as we go into this series that we understand first and foremost. This isn't just something that you can walk the aisle and decide you're going to do it and it's just going to happen. How many times have you decided you're going to do something and it didn't happen? The reality is we probably couldn't... I know I couldn't count the times that I decided I was going to do something. Do you know how many times I've decided I'm going to clean out my, my work shed? A lot. And it's spotless right now. And if you believe that last statement, then don't listen to infomercials because you'll have a lot of ass seen on TV stuff. (laughs) Because it's not. There are so many times 
that we've made the decision, I'm going to do this. But understanding the fruit of the Spirit is not something you do. It's something the Spirit does. And you just simply show what the Spirit has done in you. Our self-will only takes us so far, but the Holy Spirit can take us so much further. So I encourage you over these next several weeks to rely on the Spirit. I encourage you this week, don't rely on your flesh. The Bible shows us in this text, Galatians chapter 5, what the flesh, the byproduct of the flesh is. We have to rely on the Spirit. We have to listen to the Spirit. And can I tell you one more thing about the Spirit before we close? The Spirit will never guide you in a way contrary to Scripture. In fact, the Holy Spirit will teach you as you study Scripture. But the question is this, are we listening to the Scripture or are we listening to self? See, there is a war between the flesh and the Spirit. And I like the old illustration, which one wins? Usually the one you feed. Are we feeding our spirit or are we feeding our flesh? You know, the reality is this, and I think we've learned this through the quarantine time. It's often not what we have opportunity to do. It's often what we have appetite to do. And as we look, we often feed our flesh because it makes our flesh feel good. You know, it's one of those things, Facebook is a good tool. Right now, we're live streaming on Facebook, and, and I can see several different people who are, who are watching, and thank you so much for watching. But here's the thing. It's a great tool. It's also a dangerous thing. Because here's the thing about Facebook. You get to pick who's your friends. You get to pick who sh stuff shows up on your wall. And you know what you normally pick? That which you like. And so what you're doing is you're fueling yourself Oftentimes with things of the flesh that brings about a certain emotional feeling. If you want to be angry, all you have to do is go on Facebook and you'll find reasons to be angry. If you want to, be, if you want to laugh, you can go there. And I'm just using Facebook as an example. You could use YouTube, you could use the internet, you can use books, you can use all sorts of things. You can just go into the community. And we feed the flesh. And the problem is, our flesh often leads us to places we shouldn't be. The Spirit speaks, and the fruit of the Spirit is exactly what we ought to be. I encourage you this week, listen to the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit. Study the Scripture so that you can show fruit that you ought to instead of fruit that you ought not. It should be said of us when we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, that's normal. And when we don't, that is the exception.